Hello, everybody, and welcome. Now, how, what do I say? What do I, say? Oh, I don't oh, say welcome, do I? What's the last time we did an intro? Um, well, you see, you've been spoiled by the Swiss chalet. That's the problem. Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always. And this always. time, and this time... For the first time in 2023, <laughs> the ever wonderful Mr. Jason Johnston Yellen. Hey, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to lead us into for the very first time. Mm-hmm. I'm coming to you all live mm-hmm. from the newly opened garden office. Yeah, well, I didn't want it to all be about you, you know? Yeah, you know. Yeah, Let's start was... with the most important work you we done. Yeah, it was 2023. Well, you know what? This is a fresh beginning for you, isn't it? Is this is this like a clean slate for you, Jason? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I, I've left my family home. <laughs> I have moved to the bottom of the garden. <laughs> I, I have everything I could ever wish for in my garden office except for a toilet. Oh, man. If you had but a- I have had conversations with my local FedEx guy, and he has given me ideas. Have you considered just cutting a hole in the wall, like a butt-shaped hole? <laughs> I don't see any glory in that. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I thought you were going to go with a hole in the floor. That's where I thought you were taking that. I didn't think about a butt-shaped hole in the wall. Well, I think back to when my dad had his... My dad, for a while, um, <laughs> before he quit his work in... Uh-huh. Uh, in chemistry and became a trucker, Mm -hmm. he Mm -hmm. decided to give up his apartment and buy a boat. And he lived down a boat, 25 footer. Oh, okay. I think it's definitely easier to pee on slash off a boat. Well, the peeing isn't the problem, right? You've you've got the, the, the world (laughs) as your toilet. Um, Speak for yourself, Mr. 49 year old. (laughs) (laughs) But it's not the problem now, it soon will be. But I seem to recall like the 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 number two portion of of living <laughs> on the boat was this sort of you know, seat that was on an angle in the wall. Ah yes. Yes, yes, yes. Right? I it's, know exactly of what you speak. Yeah, and so I had that in mind. When mm-hmm. I was thinking about your garden office, like, could you just have like a, a nicely angled butt shaped hole in the wall to just <laughs> drop a deuce from? For the next time you visit? For the next time I visit. From the inside out. Yeah. My, my neighbors have specifically asked me not to stick my butt either out my window or out a butt shaped wall in my office. This is, you know, what the problem with it is it can be accessed <laughs> either way. So someone might just be passing through like, oh. Hey, there's a toilet, and just make it. Dep- <laughs> are we using any of this? We're using all of this. <laughs> are we working on any usable intro material? All right, come for the whiskey, stay for the. How does one poop when one doesn't have access to a toilet? <laughs> Jason, Joshua. talk to me. We've done all the things. We don't, we don't say so in transitions. We don't use one another's names in transitions. This one is serious. We have used them all. All of them. We're in a new year. <laughs> Did new you... year, same old as. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? Fuck. You, you Wherever I go, that's yeah. where I am. That's, uh... <laughs> what dram or drams did you pour to celebrate the new year did did you have some did you think about them i didn't, I didn't. you didn't I didn't at all no i was in bed for 10 30 and just moved on with my life i think i think new year is the worst time of year i i really i actively dislike it and what why do you actively yeah, I just dislike think it's, it i think it's ridiculously stupid and and i think it it highlights the circularity of time rather than the linear linearity of time. Mm. And, and I, you know, like it brings us back around to where we were 12 months ago, but really we're still just moving forward into the future. So 
Oh, so are are you saying that the annual celebration of a new year is counter to how we should be proceeding in life? Like it, in a sense, yes. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, what whiskey did you have? <laughs> so I, I had I had three whiskeys. I oh. I wanted to have something that uh, commemorated the year that we were going into. So I got a twenty three year old Imperial by Exclusive Malts. Okay, uh, it's the Bottle. only sherry, not the only, but the only open sherry cask Imperial that I own. Mm. When was it bottled? When was it bottled? I asked you first. This one was distilled. Okay, so there you go. It was distilled in 1990, bottled in January 2014. Mm, I'm looking and, at a tall bottle in your hand. Yeah, right? So this was oh, part of his label. birds. I always like yeah. the bird labels. But it was a bird, even when he did the bird label, it was in that sh- sort of uh, more squat, wider bottle. This is in a standard tall round. I don't know if the whole bottling went into the went into this bottle. I think this bottle was his line sample. He mm-hmm. gift, yeah, David Sturk gifted me this bottle, and I've you can see I enjoyed ha- half of it. You have been enjoying it. So that was one whiskey. Then the other whiskey was a red breast. Oh, there you go. Which one? Uh, so this was a small batch, Castorinth small batch for Julio's Liquors and Redstone Liquors in Massachusetts. Mm. And uh, it's all, all from Oloroso Sherry Casks. A small batch red breast. Is there an age statement on it? Oh, yeah. Actually, it's not. Sh- yeah. So it's I'll read this to you. you. Unique among whiskeys, Red Breast Small Batch is a single pot still Irish whiskey comprising exclusively of pot still whiskeys, which have been triple distilled and matured for no less than 14 years in a combination of bourbon and sherry casks. So and how go. long have you had that bottle, do you think? That's a good question. I've had it for some time. I bought this prior to the pandemic. And I mm, and I okay. just I just opened it. I opened this on um, just a few days before Christmas Eve. Whoa, you've yeah. been enjoying that. Well, I Finding shared it. Good company. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I, I, <laughs> right? Because we we had it. We had people over for um, latkes and like just whatever. So I shared this with those people, and that's where the majority of the damage went on this bottle because on new year's eve we just had we had um one couple over and they don't drink we just sort of uh, ate ate cheese and played charades and i had a couple <laughs> couple pours of whiskey that's the closest one can get to drinking by oneself on new year's eve <laughs> <laughs> I know there were other people present. You were kind of drinking alone. I, I was totally drinking alone. But I tell you, we we watched the ball drop. Well, we didn't watch the ball drop. We watched the Dolly Parton, Miley Cyrus thing for for about three minutes, and uh, it became twenty twenty. <laughs> <That's all> it, <laughs> it became twenty twenty three, and we went to sleep. And I wasn't drunk at any point in the night, and I woke up feeling great. That's not so bad. It's kind of nice when you can wake up feeling great after a New Year's Eve gathering. You know you're getting old when feeling up feeling great like happens less often. My spleen than the didn't hurt. Of- <laughs> What's your third pour? Fuck. <laughs> We're not going to start the year with an incomplete Joshua Hatton mm. list. We're going to complete this list hail or high water. Trying to remember what my oh, do you know what my third pour was? I know what my third pour was. Was it your whiskey of the year? Oh, you see, it wasn't my whiskey of the year. It was the um, it was the Highland Park Hjarta. Oh, fantastic! Yep. Yep. And yep, Dabby Dozy. Yep, doesn't get. Oh, you went than sherry, that. sherry, sherry. Did you say that red breast was sherry, or did you correct that? Yeah, it was bourbon and sherry. Yeah, bourbon it was and sherry, three yeah. sherries. Yep. 
Well, can I can I get in on the action then? So, I tell you what I do like about the new year. All right. Not not New Year's Eve, not not New Year's Day, not not that part of things. In the new year, I like seeing friends for the first time and having that dram of the dram that will set them on the road into that new year, mm. right? And so I had a, a good friend over on uh, th- Thursday, Friday. <laughs> yeah, time, how does it work? It must have been, <laughs> gosh, Tuesday into Thursday. It was Thursday. It was Thursday. This is all good material. Thursday. <laughs> how does Jason How does Jason remember days of the week? Um, Can you extend this part of it? Was it Thursday? <laughs> I can check my calendar, so I'm 100% certain. <sighs> um, so he came by on Thursday, yeah. and I broke out a whiskey that is, it's from a distillery that, that I don't normally dabble in, and, and he certainly doesn't dabble in, but it's it's a distillery that's spe- taken on special meaning because of, of you and, and your involvement in my life. Interesting. And, and then it's a selection by someone else who has taken on more importance in my life. Hmm. And and it's a cracking dram, absolutely cracking. And Great Highland, incredible sherry presence, first fill sherry butt. Okay. Bottled at 66.6% alcohol. Oh, jeepers. I can only think of from one. From... Yeah. Signatory to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Whiskey Exchange. Do I know this bottle? Was it the Klein Leash? The Klein Leash 18? No, that wasn't. 11 year old. It wasn't Klein Leash. Okay. Oh, you want me to be. Am I guessing? Is this where I guess? No, you want me to shut up so you can continue your story. <laughs> I was just waiting to see what you wanted to do. Here, what's the name of the distillery? You said Highland. Highland, special oh. connection for you and me. Big S- sherry profile on this particular bottling. High alcohol. I would uh, assume selected by Ollie. Um, Sukinder, if it was for the 20th anniversary, I'm sure Sukinder had a hand in this as well. A Highland distillery that I gave you, like you found an appreciation for this distillery through knowing me. Ben Nevis. <laughs> it's a good answer. We actually followed it with a Ben Nevis. Okay. And, and I poured the funky monkey that you got from the Whiskey Exchange. Oh, um, and that peated over Ben Nevis. Yeah. Oh, boy, did it's, I it's a, like that. It's, a, it's much softer now. It's not the same funky monkey you, you gave me. It was like nightmares. I didn't like it. Anyway. Can, oh, no, that's a good, good whiskey. My friend Jared guessed Le Chig on that Ben Nevis. I was like, yep, I see exactly why you say that. Exactly yeah. why you say yeah, that. Yeah, maybe it's got that funky yeah. monkey peated quality mm-hmm. going on. Yeah, um, with a bit of that sherry going around the Highland peat funk. Anyway, that's a different whiskey. The one we're talking about <laughs> is from a distillery. Uh-huh. As soon as I give you the letter, you're going to get the distillery. Oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> I love it when you don't. To be honest, yeah. Uh, Highland Distillery begins with the letter D that has oh, a special Deanston. place. There you go. There you go, Deanston. Yep. Really cracking Deanston. And so that was that was the first pour for myself and Jared as we oh. look into this 2023. He's starting a, a new job, uh, the first working Monday of, of the new year. And so sent him on happy trails, beginning with that Deanston, followed it with the Ben Nevis, and then, you know, made our way through a few others. <laughs> nice. I, I, I like that, right? Because... That is, it's a new beginning for him. So that's, it's a, it's a cool way to honor it. There you go. So as you said a moment ago, mm. we had our year in review, mm. which was a, a terrific episode. <laughs> terrific episode. I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners are almost finished listening to it. Um, a fantastic episode. But for now, mm-hmm. we are moving into a year in preview Mm-hmm. With our very dear friend Susanna Skyver Barton, who Indeed. we've had on the podcast before, that we have. And here's here's the thing: I've I've been thinking about this 
<laughs> since we recorded the interview with her. I go into talking to her thinking we see the whiskey industry the same way. Yeah. And coming out of talking with her, I'm always struck by her perspective. Mm. And she always says things that I haven't thought about. And she always, <laughs> you know, reflects mm -hmm. upon things that I haven't thought about. And even when we get to this year in preview with her, and we, we talk a bit about 22, gosh, we get into the last decade of whiskey. Yeah. And we use that to inform what we're looking at as we're going into 23. And there was there's a part that will come up later on in the interview that when she said it, I thought, yeah, you're so right. That That is a something we should be watching out for in 2023 and yeah. discussing more in 23. I thought it was really excellent. And so, yeah, I wanted to make that, that particular point clear. Her perspective is pleasingly different from my own. Mm. Oh, I like that. Here's something that I liked about the interview. Like you had said, we we had Susanna on before. But s similarly to the reason I selected you and Morgan, you know, last year as my 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 episode of the year, my favorite mm -hmm. conversation of the mm -hmm. year, it was because it was getting together with with an old whiskey friend and and talking about whiskey that's a ton of fun and and it's nice getting together with Susanna because a she's a friend she's a lot of fun to talk to but exactly what you said she's one that that I would always follow her articles and and read because well it's because of the very reason we brought her on to the podcast she has her finger yeah. on the pulse she this is her yeah. life. She she kind of breathes it and is she's paying attention to so much of the industry that we simply don't have the time to pay attention to that we get to have this this whiskey conversation with a friend and she brings us up to date and she tells us what to look forward to. I really liked that and I think listening back and editing back to it, I, I already feel as if this episode is a contender for for an episode of the year. <laughs> it's it was it was just it was just great and and interesting. And I think too. Sometimes I come to an interview, and I'll have some questions in mind, and I think I do an okay job. It's conversations like the one we had with Susanna, where I felt I really needed to rise to the challenge and ask different probing questions I, she i feel as if she kind of forced me to ask better questions and uh and i and i kind of like that about this conversation <laughs> i was thinking during it when we'd set up the interview with her and and for the benefit of the listeners here we'd sent an email saying okay this time this place this link you know let, let's make this happen and and, and we had called it from the very beginning a year in preview. Mm -hmm. And and Susanna had written back and said, well, let me know if there's anything in particular you <laughs> want to ask about. And, and we'd responded and just said, look, it's just the industry writ large, you know, like mm -hmm. 23. And as we then, you know, transitioned to the actual interview, and as listeners are about to hear in just a few moments, the first question is, so, so what do you see in the future? <laughs> and she said, and, and, and she's kind of like, well, where? Yeah. Who? How? And she's like, that's kind of broad. But then she starts going into it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and as we went through our conversation, you know, we spend time, a lot of time on bourbon. I didn't expect that going into our interview. We spend a little bit of time on single malt scotch. That's always my number one focus. That always mm. takes up most of my brain. We go into American single malts. Mm -hmm. That's an exciting addition that is definitely roaming around in my brain. We talk consumers. We talked retailers. We talked wholesalers. 
right? We cover that three tier system. So there's there's a lot on the table there, mm-hmm. and it's it's teasing out distinct aspects of this industry yeah. writ large. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> Yeah, listen, I don't I don't think that there's much else we could say. I think we should probably just hand it over to our conversation with with us and Susanna and then once we come out of that conversation, we'll have a bit of news to share and we will finally do a tasting of our fourth and final blind barrel sample that we received from uh from Seabass. Let's go. Happy New Year, Susanna. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I am tickety boo. And I am very excited to kick off the year talking to you about everything that 2023 can possibly hold from a whiskey industry standpoint. Everything? Every single thing. All right. Every, all the things. Did you Don't. see our last episode was four hours? <laughs> we have all the time in the world to discuss this in minute detail. Great. We're going to be here for a while. Yeah. Do not leave a single <laughs> detail out. <laughs> you cleared your whole calendar for this. <laughs> so uh, can, I, can I ask you a question? Since it's an interview, I feel like it's the right thing to do. How did you think... 2022 went with the industry uh overall like across all categories of whiskey it could have been worse (laughs) it was it was an improvement (laughs) i thought it was only us saying that okay cool (laughs) no i think it was an improvement on 2021 and 2020 Mm. um it was heartening you know to have a full year of having no um tariffs at least for scotch and coming to the u.s i can't remember when mm-hmm. the uk mm-hmm. lifted their tariffs on american that might have been 2022 time is meaningless now it was um so that'll You're be correct. but that that's very optimistic and gives i think it's very positive coming into this year too um you know that's such a broad question because we can look at it from the yes, point of is. view of tariffs and and pure cold numbers and data but I think we also can and will and should look at it from the the perspective of just the consumer and the whiskey drinker and what was the year like for them. And I think it was very dependent on what you were trying to drink or drinking in, in 2022. So if you were like you hmm. or me or Josh and trying to drink, yeah. you know, good single malt scotch, I think it was a, good, a great year for that. Um, because good single malt scotch was not really going up in price for the most part. I think prices. Mm, interesting. Well, interesting. Uh, after 2019 and into 2021, I think things mm-hmm. held last year. Um, mm-hmm. If you're trying to drink everyday bourbon, fine. But most bourbon drinkers, or at least the ones we hear from, are trying to drink more than just everyday bourbon. And it was another difficult year um, if you were chasing after the <laughs> the trendy stuff, the hot stuff. Yeah, well, th- that's a good point, though, about the bourbon. I think one of the things that, that I saw change, and, and maybe you'll agree, maybe you, you, you'll disagree, and this isn't exclusive to 2022, it's been a bit of an evolution, was that the description of what an everyday drinking bourbon is mm. has changed right like mm-hmm. blanton's was an everyday bourbon elmer <laughs> t lee was an everyday bourbon what was blanton's ever really an everyday bourbon though i would challenge that i <laughs> well, think blanton's what? was priced where it could be every day for people who yeah. five or ten years ago you know were used to paying everyday scotch prices but if you were a bourbon drinker ten years ago Blanton's was not an everyday price and it wasn't an everyday bourbon. Oh, Just look at the way it looks. Mm-hmm. Okay. People, even, mm-hmm. even if they could afford it for every day, I mean, Blanton's is presented as more than every day because of its appearance and it's a single yeah, barrel well, and all of that. So mm-hmm. I would challenge that, that assumption, but I would not challenge what you said to, to begin with, which is that 
what is an everyday bourbon has evolved. I think that is true. Mm, an everyday bourbon okay. used to be yeah. wild turkey 101. Now that's like that's at the very low end of everyday bourbon. Now Maker's 46 is an everyday bourbon. Um, you know, to, to a lot of people, a Russell's Reserve is going to be an everyday bourbon. Oh, that's interesting. Pivoting back just real quickly for the listeners, what kind of price would you be talking on the Blantons? Because I like what Susanna is saying about if you were buying everyday scotch, everyday Blantons look very affordable. What kind of number are we talking there? I mean, 10 years ago, I think Blanton's was around 30 to 40 bucks. And now yep. okay. I Five think... is what I paid. Yeah, the SRP now is, I think, around 60. But okay. <laughs> if you're finding it for SRP, you know, it's that's that's um, highly unusual. <laughs> Let's just say. <laughs> and $35 for a bourbon 10 years ago was for sure, like, on the high end for because just like mm-hmm. Maker's Mark 10 years ago was like a 20 to $25 bottle. Mm-hmm. And again, like Wild Turkey 101, that was like a $15 bottle. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it makes me think of the, the Heaven Hill 6, the bottled and bond that was $12 a bottle. Yes. Uh, but remember, screaming, that was also available only in Kentucky. Kentucky. Also very it's, true. Yep, it's very it's true. anachronistic to, to compare that, I think, because most people mm-hmm. couldn't access mm-hmm. it. But but the point is mm-hmm. well is is well taken, you know that um, mm-hmm. it, we were just a decade ago working in different price bands. So that an everyday scotch ten years ago was probably thirty to forty. You know, I'm giving that kind of wider range because you could get Glenlivet twelve, probably around thirty bucks, maybe thirty five. You know, if you wanted to mm-hmm. move up a little bit, you were probably looking at around forty dollars <laughs> for something a little more interesting. Yeah, like a Belvini or something. It, yeah. it, you're right. That, <laughs> yeah. and that's what I was going to say. It's, it's, so, it's so funny how we're defining these categories because for me, 20 years ago, it was Balvenie Doublewood that I considered an everyday scotch. And that was in that $35 range, which then moved into the, the 60s and is working its way north of that. Yeah. Um, it, it, is, it is funny, the, the tastes that we have and the, the places <laughs> where we... Uh, feel most comfortable when you mentioned Glenfiddich 12 a second ago I've never in my life thought of Glenfiddich 12 as a as a daily scotch but obviously for millions of people it absolutely is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I think <laughs> you know for again fla, as, fla, fla. as scotch drinkers single malt drinkers in particular we are already primed to expect to pay more for it that's just what yeah. scotch mm-hmm. has done for the entirety of its you know, post 1960s existence. Um, whereas bourbon, this is still a really recent phenomenon that people are looking at a fifty dollar bottle and saying, "Yeah, it's an everyday drinker." Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's mm-hmm. everyday for for everybody or even the majority of bourbon drinkers. But I still think that if you're really into bourbon and you see a a bottle for fifty dollars of something that seems exciting or good. You're not really going to find that to be very unusual. So, yeah, I just I like when we when you go on Facebook or you go on Twitter or Instagram and like insert crotch shot here, right? Um, that that's what we see, and, and that's what you read about, right? In in the magazines, you're reading about the fancy, the special. Meanwhile go into any shop that isn't on the East Coast or on the West Coast, look on the bottom shelf, and you're going to find plenty of handles of 40% bourbon or some sort of a American whiskey blend still at dirt cheap prices. Like, do we just simply have a skewed view of it because we're so in the thick of whiskey? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 100%. Like, of course we do. Of course we do. And I think, and, and the people we drink whiskey with and hang out with, even if they don't work in the industry or write about it like I do, mm-hmm. they, because we hang out with them, like, presumably most of our whiskey friends are whiskey people. Um, and so mm-hmm. that also, you know, we it's confirmation bias that, yeah, everybody is drinking Belvini Doublewood. But actually, no, like a lot of people are, are drinking McClellan's. Um, which I don't mm. even know who uh, who bottles that. Is that a Ian McLeod or? That, no, I don't know. Was, yeah, it was. It was, it was Morrison, Morrison Bowmore back yeah. in the day. All right, I, who who knows who owns it these days? But 
it's mm-hmm. it is true and I, so i moved to north carolina in 2022 um which is a place i grew up but uh, obviously i wasn't drinking or going into liquor stores as a minor um and this <laughs> is my much. first oh, time sorry, as a minor <laughs> <laughs> my first time living here since i since college right and in college <laughs> where was i going when i went into the liquor store i was going straight to the bottom shelf vodka obviously whatever was cheapest <laughs> and would mix into jungle juice but so <laughs> yep now I'm going into the liquor store mostly for curiosity. I'm not buying much in there, but I go to the bourbon section, which is which is big. It's, it's certainly bigger than I'm sure it was in the early 2000s when I last lived here. Sure. And um, it's really not shocking, but surprising to me how many brands all on well, almost all on the bottom shelf. Um, of that, that I've never heard of are there, you know, and I can pick them up and read the label and usually divine which company is making them and just <laughs> bottling them and selling them. I mean, you know, they may, and they may be just a control state brand. They may be just for North Carolina, you know, like uh, uh, these may not be available in other markets, but Heaven Hill or Sazerac or whoever owns that brand, you know, has a great, contract in place or you know they've built up a market for this particular bourbon or whatever but but i do find it interesting because i've as as a writer never had any exposure to these brands at all and frankly if i go to someone's house who's not really a whiskey person but like they know i am if they offer me a whiskey they'll bring out like oh hey here's my gentleman jack or here you know i've got some great maker's mark or you know they they bring out nice stuff for me which i appreciate but i'm so interested in these these really cheap plastic handles. And one of these days I will pitch a story to someone and, and hopefully they'll, they'll bite and take it about like drinking, drinking these no name bottom shelf whiskeys of the control States. Um, just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it would be a particularly interesting story, but I think, I, you know, if I could get the companies to talk to me about them, it might be. Um, but the other side of that too is that they're they're not all bottom shelf. So there's also this like really interesting l- layer in the shelves, kind of around the premium to super premium level, um, sitting alongside you know some of the like Hardens Creek from Jim Beam or uh, maybe a a, a, um, a Maker's Private Select that the ABC picked, and there'll there'll be these like nice looking super premium bourbons with names again i do not recognize and have never seen and i like turn it over and look at the back and these are not coming from the likes of sazerac or heaven hill these are coming from companies i've never heard of you know like some who knows you know maybe someone who's just contracting with like a bardstown bourbon company or maybe not them specifically they're pretty transparent but like whoever and bottling Mm. this uh whiskey that's probably around four years old um, and is usually 80 to 86 proof and has a very fancy looking package and like slick marketing language and like a cool name, usually something affiliated with like dogs or hunting or America. You know, I live in an army based town, so there's lots of like stars and stripes kind of uh, spirits around. Um, and those I yeah. find very interesting, too, because, again, I bet the whiskey itself is not actually that like compelling to me as a serious whiskey drinker, but the, the marketing, right. Or the existence of that bottle on the shelf is providing some kind of reason for people to pick it up. Unless of course, like the ABC stocks it as a one-off, nobody buys it and then they don't stock it again. But (laughs) (laughs) But that was, that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you is, is this realm of marketing? And do you think people consumers are defining themselves by the spirit they're drinking or are they defining themselves by the bottle and the package that they're putting on their shelf and pulling out for friends who are coming over when you say defining themselves by the spirit do you mean like the style or the specific brand the 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 actual liquid the flavors the profile the texture to some extent maybe um, I think the subset of, of people who are really into um, barrel proof or like super oaky bourbons, um, maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but I think for a lot of people, it's much more brand based. Um, and not to say that they're loyal to a particular brand or, you know, I'm a, I'm, I mean, of course you still have people who are, I'm a Jack Daniels guy. And like, that's great. Like mm -hmm. Jack Daniels really, mm -hmm. that's the brand you have to think of when someone's like super loyal, it's Jack or Jim, or if they're Scott Street or Johnny. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I do, One of those I, guys. I think it's not overtly packaging and marketing. No one would be like, I, mm. I do, you know, like this is my favorite bourbon because I love the way the bottle looks on my shelf. Of yeah, course yeah, that's true. Yeah. A lot of people lo look at, you can, all three of us are mm -hmm. surrounded, but, you know, people won't be able to see this, but we're, we're talking on <laughs> zoom and we're all three surrounded by shelves of bottles and I love the way various bottles look on my shelf. Um, and I think that's true of everybody who drinks spirits as more than just a, a way to get drunk, you know, who's interested in spirits and, and drinks them as a hobby. But no one would admit to, I bought it for the bottle. I mean, maybe if it's like a really novelty bottle, but usually not. But I think the bottle is part of that where people are yeah. caught up in the, in the story. I know every marketer in the world talks about storytelling these days. Um, but it is really true. People, <laughs> people want to feel that whatever they have chosen to put on their shelf and put in their glass, you know, has some meaning for them and who can blame them. And, and the brands that are creating meaning, I think are going to stand the test of time right now. There's a lot of brands who aren't, um, hmm. the field is very crowded. It's hard to do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's possible to do it, but it's, really hard to do it if you're buying barrels or contract distilling and that's you know and, and and you're coming up with a story about your brand that isn't really about either of those things um yeah and so i just realized i'm saying this to two independent bottlers but it, but you guys obviously <laughs> you know strike a different chord you are obviously independent bottlers that's the whole point of your company you mm. talk about the barrels you talk about where they come from the story of each Correct, yeah. distillery that you work with becomes part of your story. It's very transparent. Yeah. It's very honest, yeah. very authentic. And there are a lot of brands right now pro who probably can't be honest because you work with a broker or whoever, you know, you access these barrels. You're not allowed to say they came from the mm -hmm. 1792 distillery or whatever. But at the same time, you know, at the same time, you can't really, I don't think they're, they're making so much of an effort to uh, develop a real point of access for consumers other than the bottle looks great. The whiskey's fine. I don't want to go, I don't want to, you know, put anybody down, but I'm exhausted by the number of brands that come out that are sourced bourbon that are fine. The bourbon's fine. I'm sure the people who are making it are just decent business people, but there's just, there's nothing there. It's an air sandwich as far as, story and as far as me as a journalist like I, I i hate you know we i hate to say it but this is the truth like w stories that people want to publish are stories about what's new what's exciting what's different another bourbon that comes from wherever mgp or undisclosed that is four to six years old that is 70 to 80 dollars and that has a name no one's ever heard of and nothing really compelling about it it's very hard to write about it's very hard to get excited about it. And that, that's why I thought it was the right time in the conversation to ask you my question, because it seems like you could be a business person, you could join all the dots, you could have liquid in a bottle, and then you stick an American flag on it, or a hunting dog, or another racehorse, and now you've got, quote-unquote, a brand. And I'm, I'm, obviously it's resonating with people that I don't know, but... Like, how is that resonating? How is I that landing? I don't, I don't think all of it is resonating. I think a lot of mm. these brands are finding success because it's frankly really hard to get allocated limited edition, you know, more interesting bourbons. Mm. If you, you know, yeah. the demand is too high right now. So they're, they're succeeding because people just want to buy something different and that there it is, there's something different. And maybe they, drink, take their bottle home, drink it. They're like, okay, that was different. It wasn't different enough for me to go and spend another 75 bucks on it. But you know, I don't regret mm. that one purchase, but that's not how you, obviously that's not how you build a, a, a brand for the long term. 
Um, it reminds mm-hmm. me a lot of probably like five or seven years ago. Um, there was this real boom in Irish whiskey brands, all sourcing from Cooley. Yeah. All yep. around $30 all with like an Irish sounding name and, you know, green packaging and shamrocks or whatever, and all tasting exactly the same and good because mm-hmm. Cooley is delicious, but, yep. um, mm-hmm. but they all kind of just flooded the market all at once. And you know, of all the brands that came out around then, maybe there's two or three I, that are probably still sort of in with decent distribution, maybe making some sales, but I think a lot of them just faded away. Um, it's, mm-hmm. you know, cause they offered nothing different for consumers, including, you know, at that point they didn't even offer any different stories. You know, I think some people are enjoy the like Irishness of just, it's an mm-hmm. Irish, Oh, it's an Irish name. Oh, from the old, the old, the old <laughs> County with the old folks. Um, but, but most whiskey drinkers now, and even five or seven years ago, weren't, you know, it was even, if you're drinking Irish whiskey, you were drinking Jameson or you were drinking Redbreast mm-hmm. and in between yeah, there wasn't exactly. that market yet. There is, there is now, but there wasn't then. It, it's, mm. it's interesting though that, you know, I, I like that you brought the Irish part of it into the conversation because... I forgot how much that that started to mirror what we had been seeing in the bourbon world. And just really quickly back to the bourbon world, I had, I guess, wrongly assumed that after the 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 Templeton Rye incident where they got into a bit of trouble. <laughs> right? Well deserved. That you, yeah, they actually but, but did it, actually lie. Well, they did. Um, but, but, the, but the thing around that was it, it really seemed to be this, there seemed to be a segment of people calling for transparency, like, wait, wait a second, what are we drinking? This isn't made in such and such a state. They're getting this from, you know, and for a while it thought like, oh, we, we might start to understand where this liquid is actually coming from and maybe we'll get some real stories. Meanwhile, there's plenty of you know, horse brands or, uh, uncle Jebediah's sour mash, (laughs) you know, my great, great grandpa, you know, all, all of this stuff. I, I had hoped we'd get more toward transparency, especially in this modern internet age. As we're looking at 2023 and beyond, do, do you see a place for that? Do you see the, evolution towards more transparency or do you think we'll still like revert back into this more comfortable position of great granddad's whatever or patio tools you know you know (laughs) single pot still you know whatever (laughs) um i i i think we are in a better place than we were since the the templeton time and also we have a lot of runway. Um, it's not, it's not a linear progression, right? It's not, mm-hmm. we can't just go from A, I mean, we could, but we haven't and we won't just go from A to B all the way to Z because, um, it's not a unified force of people calling for transparency. The bourbon consumer segment. Um, at the time of right the Templeton incident was I think had a higher concentration of kind of uh, diehard whiskey nerds and people really mm-hmm. into whiskey as as a more than just a casual pastime but like you know yeah uh, and so it felt like yes okay we're all pushing for transparency and <clears throat> Templeton got, you know, judgment handed down to them in court. I think they had to pay back a bunch of money. That felt like a great win. Now we're seeing very few companies overtly lying now. But yes, the, this sort of lack of transparency about <laughs> who made the whiskey, where where did it come from, whatever. The consumer segment, I think, now has a has been diluted by people who have come into bourbon for whom that is a less important value. I don't, I still don't think any bourbon drinker is okay with 
Uncle Jebediah's, you know, oh, it was Uncle Jebediah's recipe, you know, for this bourbon. And I think most bourbon drinkers are very skeptical of those claims now, but not all. And there's and there's enough people in the you know out there buying bourbon now that these kinds of brands you know can have a hope of selling their bottles. Um, again, I don't think that that's a way to. Uh, I don't think that's a long term strategy. And I think most of them are not going to find extended success there. Um, and meanwhile, I, I think the push for transparency, I think you can already see what that has yielded. Look at companies. Um, we talked about Bardstown Bourbon Co. a minute ago. Bardstown Bourbon Co., oh. which is almost entirely a contract distiller, but has its own brands. They put out huge amounts of information about what they're making. You know, I really commend mm-hmm. them. They share the mash bills. They talk about how old the whiskeys are. If you read their labels, you know, it's nicely broken down. And they're not the only one. I think there are a lot more distillers who are responding to the call for transparency with sharing of information, talking about, you know, and sometimes it's just straight up part of the marketing strategy. Like, oh, well, we'll tell you what level of which warehouse these barrels aged in because we know like you're really into honey barrels from particular warehouses, but that's okay. You know, it's still, it's still information that they're sharing. And as they do that, we, the consumer start to expect that more and more and thus demand it of the companies Mm -hmm. who aren't doing it. Um, so, so it's, it's a mixed bag, but I still think that, that we're trending towards continued transparency. What I'd like to see is more transparency from companies about things that are not um, strictly related to just the hard production of the bourbon, but like, how about transparency about how you treat your workers? Transparency about Mm. um, environmental uh, efforts that you're doing, you know, talk about um, how you're reducing your wastewater or, or whatever. Some things that I think that's the next level of transparency that I am mm, hoping the industry starts to um, share. Because I, I think there are, again, a lot of success stories to share in there. I mean, whiskey making is a resource intensive um, process, but there are definitely uh, distilleries making strides in reducing their carbon footprint, in recycling their wastewater, in you know this or that. And they should be making that a part of their message to consumers. Um, so the consumers yeah. know that this is an important thing to value as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm seeing that on the Scotch whiskey side of things, right. With Arden American and Nick Nian. And then, you know, with Isla distilleries really, you know, putting a focus on peat and, and what that does to the environment. Meanwhile, gardening centers are are responsible yeah. for ninety nine percent of the whole peat yep. stuff, but that's yep. another story. Ninety six, um, to be fair. Oh, all right, ninety six. <laughs> I think uh, that so, ban is now enforced. I, I think that's now happened. That garden centers are now out of the peat business. Oh, oh I thought that's that was great. A, oh, <laughs> I was just about to say, I thought that was a twenty twenty three thing. Guess what, kids? It's 2023. <laughs> Welcome to the year in preview. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it, like we're starting to see that, and there you go, year in preview, right? 2023. <laughs> if if we have the year right, you know, you have you've got the UK government putting a ban on on peat for garden centers, and you have distilleries really paying close attention to what their production does to peat. I guess my question to you, because you really do have your, your your thumb on the pulse, you're the writer about the new stuff, the new and exciting stuff. Are you hearing whispers of more of that? And and do you think do you think it's consumer driven that they're looking for this? Do the consumers care about it, or are the consumers will the consumers learn to care about it? as more producers embrace these green initiatives? I think it's both, but more the latter. Um, Mm. I think consumers are not aware that they should care about it. 
there are a lot of people who care about the environment, who care about impacts on, you know, mm-hmm. local uh, flora and fauna or whatever. And they sure. have mm-hmm. absolutely no awareness of uh, how the whiskey industry fits into that. Um, because why would they? You know, most people who drink a bourbon or a scotch are never going to visit a distillery. They're probably mm-hmm. never going to even be able to tell you what fermentation is. And that's perfectly mm-hmm. okay. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of people who drink whiskey may not even be able to tell you what its base ingredient is. Um, and again, totally okay. But these are mm-hmm. p- potentially also people who go to the store and buy organic meat or um, uh, or vegetables, yeah. you know, or, or people who are looking for fair trade coffee. People who have yeah. values that they express through their purchases um, mm-hmm. and that they have, you know, learned about and decided based on years of education, whether self-education or education from, from the industry, you know, about, about the differences. What's the difference between a, a, a cage chicken and a free range one? You know, what's the difference between yeah. this or that? And so I think, and, and materially, it, you know, what ends up in the bottle, is there a difference between something that's made at a plant that, you know, has reduced its carbon footprint by X or Y and, and something that isn't? No, you are not going to be able to taste that in the whiskey in most cases, mm. but that doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, so yeah. yep. I, I think, I think the industry has to lead here and I certainly think, um, small distillers like you named Arden American and McNeon in Scotland. Yeah. And there are craft distillers, lots of craft distillers here in the U.S. who absolutely have made those values part of their operating procedures mm-hmm. and part of what they talk to mm-hmm. people about. But they are small. You know, we need we need yeah. to have the industry leaders doing that, too. And I want to give some credit like Diageo. I get press releases from them every now and then about this distillery or that has been made carbon neutral and they, they have put money into lots of impressive technologies. And, you know, I, I, I want to give them a shout out for that. Um, nice. But that's not, you know, like where are they talking about that, you know, on the side of the, the bullet bottle or the Johnny Walker box, you know, that the, they're, they're expecting, yeah. they're expecting some coverage from the media and they get it sometimes. But that's not enough. You know, that needs to, I think we need to start um, telling, <laughs> lots of brands are like, we want to tell a new story about whiskey. And I'm like, great. This is a new story you can tell. This is a new framework, <laughs> a new framework through which you can present whiskey. But very few are doing that at this point, perhaps because very few are able to do that. You know, like a lot of distilleries mm-hmm. are mm-hmm. not anywhere close to being environmentally friendly. And maybe, you know, the companies are working on that. But again, these these little guys um, who have built that into their business from day one, uh, hats yeah. off to them. They're going <laughs> to they're they're going to lead the way for now. And then if some larger players get involved, that's when the momentum, I think, will start. Yeah, I also wonder if, if for the consumer there's a certain cynicism that at this moment being environmental becomes a marketing ploy. Totally. And when you th- throw around words like carbon neutral, the consumer rolls their eyes and, well, of course you are because you think that's what I'm looking for. Mm. But I th- there are obviously real conversations to be had there. And I and I think having producers take on a um, a role there that moves beyond the marketing and, and the simple market release, I think can really help and and help get the consumer mm. beyond that cynicism as well. You know, it's 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 been true for a good few years in Scotland. You go around a distillery, and at some point they'll tell you about the water treatment plant that's behind that line of trees if you look out <laughs> that window over there. Yeah. But, but, but it was never really rolled into anything bigger than that. It was no. more just a, here's the point at which we tell you to trust us on water. Moving yeah. on. 
No, I, I totally agree with you. And I think the, the big distilleries, the big players are going to have to make peace with the fact that at the beginning, this is not going to be something with ROI. You shouldn't be mm-hmm. talking about this because you hope it will sell more bottles. You, you should be talking about it because it's a real part yeah. of your operating ethos and the way you make the whiskey. And it's important. And I think it's important for the long run health of the industry because you know, these issues are not going to go mm-hmm. away. They're only going to get worse. Um, I went to, you talked about the, the wastewater treatment over, but you know, the best <laughs> um, visit distillery visit I ever had uh, that, uh, you know, where I got to see up close, like all these things they were doing that had a meaningful impact was at um, a knock, you know, knock, knock do distillery, mm-hmm. but yeah. a knock oh, whiskey. Gordon, yeah, Gordon, Gordon yeah. the, the distillery manager there, he, he is such a, like whirlwind of genius. Mm-hmm. He had all these just ingenious mm-hmm. little hacks he had put into place yeah. to, to, you know, conserve energy, to reuse this and that. And, um, and he was so passionate about, you know, everything, the whole nine yards, mm-hmm. everything at the distillery and, and taking me around and explaining how this thing and that thing worked. I mean, let's see more of that. Put, please, mm-hmm. someone put Gordon on a documentary talking about this, you know, with his yeah, cute right. dogs, like, <laughs> that, <laughs> and where's, and, and, you know, and, 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 and where do we ever hear about that? I mean, you know, I don't know that IBHL like even fully understands maybe the gem that they have in, in Gordon. I'm, I'm totally singling out not to in particular, but, um, <laughs> you know, there's just, it's, uh. Yeah, it starts there and it, it can't be it cannot be a greenwashing for the sake of moving more bottles. It's yes, not gonna work. Hundred percent. Well hundred percent. And people yeah. will see through it. Yep. I, I, I think I think people will see through it. And I, I also think I wanna say I wanna say this right. I want I want this to come out as a as a neutral statement here. You will get a story from this distillery, that distillery, Diageo, Pernod, whomever, and they'll talk about their green initiatives or they'll talk about whatever, and that information doesn't necessarily get on to the label or onto the branding because the branding is very specific. If you think about um, a, a large demographic of the, of the American bourbon drinking consumer – we have we right now have this sort of cultural divide of left and right, and you've got the left that don't want to do what the right does, and you have the right that doesn't want to do what the left does. And typically speaking, the left is associated with green initiatives, climate change. How can we fix it? And the right says, "What are you talking about? It's you know that's that's not my concern. My concern is something else." And then you've got brands that are like. This is my hunting dog. This is the dead elk that I kill. You know, I'm just using terms here. And people on the left are like, that's not what I'm about. I want to, <laughs> you know, you know, treat wildlife nicely and so on and so forth. And so my point is, with, with all that laid out, do you think that larger companies have a little bit of trepidation in updating their marketing to talk about some of these green initiatives or talk about some of the other things that they do so that it fits with those with the the mindset on the right and the mindset on the left. Yes, totally. And I would also say they, they lack imagination because um, of course they're afraid because they're seeing it as a binary, but there's a lot more gray area in there. You know, and, and it's not like you have yeah. to hit people over the head with carbon footprint this and, you know, whatever, environmentalism, that. Of course not. There are so many ways to talk about this stuff that are not polarizing. And these, I yeah. don't, I, you know, and I just don't see these companies trying very hard. I don't. Because, go like, again, mm. look at a small craft distillery. I'm trying to think off the top of my head of someone in the U.S. who I really um, want to hold up as, you know, it'll come to me as soon as we've ended this Stop conversation recording. of yeah, course exactly. but but uh, but there but there are at least a half a dozen for whom these issues are a core part of how they operate and i bet if you went to them and said hey who drinks your whiskey is it democrats or republicans they'd say it's everybody because they like our whiskey 
you know, they, they're yeah. interested yep. in what we're yep. doing. They see, <clears throat> they see us doing, you know, having these impacts in our community, economic impacts, but also environmental impacts. And, mm. you know, and they want to support a small business that's, um, you know, working in this area. And so I, yeah, I would just say the, the big guys are not, they're not trying hard enough. Um, they have how many millions and tens of millions of dollars to spend on marketing. And, and so many of them just recycle the same tired old tropes. And it's like, guys, you know, be, have some imagination for Christ's sakes. Like, (laughs) you know, it's just, I know it's really hard. And when you're a big multi-million dollar company with, you know, thousands of people's jobs on the line and all that, I get it. It's, and and big ships are hard to turn, but try something. Try something. But, but go back to your example of Gordon Bruce at Nokdu. He's talking about efficiencies, and those efficiencies are saving energy. And saving energy means saving money. And saving mm-hmm. all of those things saves the environment. Mm-hmm. Like th- that to me is you can jump into that pitch, and it, it's not a pitch in the marketing sense, it's just a presentation, but you can, you can jump into that pitch at any point and see which one you value along the way. When we had Gordon on the on the podcast, uh, he actually gave the phone number for his marketing department for <laughs> listeners to call up and harangue them uh, because of his great distaste for all things marketing. Yeah. And we I actually out. beeped out the number yeah. so that listeners could not call up the marketing department for Inverhouse and harangue them. That's uh, hilarious. But, but it goes to show, right, Gordon has his fiefdom, right? The knock is his and he runs it to the absolute best of his ability uh, which is immense as you rightly point out but I think there's such an an interesting and compelling way to tell that story that speaks to what you're saying about lack of imagination uh, with certain marketing departments yeah and I certainly don't want to pick on uh, Nocte's parent company at all um, no, no, that no, was just that was just no, like no. you know that was the the example that I, I think about my visit to that distillery sure. constantly it was it was mm-hmm. fascinating to see all, you know, it's not a young distillery. It's an old, it's no. an old facility. They're still using calculators, you know, when they're, um, and hydrometers. I mean, there's no, there's no computerization of running the stills very hands-on, but then there were all, he just had all these, you know, little engineers sort of ideas, um, mm-hmm. the sorts of mm-hmm. things where His- 150 years ago, we would have patented this or that, and, you know. <laughs> gone on to well, his, horiz- his horizontal shell and tube condenser love yeah that. <laughs> uh, out, that. you know out back next to the warm tub it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a great place to go visit and he's a great man to spend time with yeah yeah so you know whiskey big whiskey companies lacking imagination i don't think that's a headline that's <laughs> mm-hmm. they're always going to be several steps behind the the more nimble yeah. little guys um, who are more, frankly, just more in touch with their consumer um, and also less concerned with maybe reaching every consumer, right? Less concerned with moving volume because they don't have volume to move. Um, and I think big companies could learn a few things from that. Hmm. But instead, they're all Can making I... highly allocated, you know, small batch <laughs> bourbons priced for too much money that will sell out immediately. I'm <laughs> with with <laughs> bourbon and, and scotch and, and Irish disgust. I'm I'm curious about a category that that Joshua and I are very close to and and champion continually. Um, but I'm curious your perspective and your experience in American single malt mm. and and what have you seen there and, and what do you think twenty three might hold for for that category. I think it was very uh, exciting when the TTB announced they were on the cusp of (laughs) formalizing the regulations for American single malt. And then we haven't gotten there yet. It's continue to sit (laughs) on the cusp, teetering a little bit. Um, It's getting uncomfortable. I think think it was was a huge deal for the industry and, and absolutely no one else. Um, mm. I don't, I don't yeah. think I, the, the number of consumers 
drinking American single malt and seeking it out are minuscule. I don't think most liquor store owners are terribly excited by it unless they are a whiskey specialty mm. shop. Um, mm-hmm. I, there is so, so, so much work to do. I think the, that distillers are capable of doing it and I'm excited. I really do think that American single malt is going to cement itself alongside bourbon and rye um, in the pantheon of great, truly American whiskeys. But it's a long time before that happens. You know, there's just, mm-hmm. there's a lot of still so much consumer outreach to do and so much just as you know, if you ask even a, even someone who's like a pretty interested whiskey drinker, Hey, do you know what single malt is? What are they going to say? You know, a lot of them are going to say, well, I think it's (laughs) scotch and maybe it's got pee or they're not (laughs) there. They might, I think it's made from, from grain. Um, it's just, there's, we're, we're still, we are still at a very, um, basic place of education and that's okay. We're farther along than we were five years ago. Um, I think it's massive, absolutely massive that Jack Daniels released a single malt last year. Massive. Um, that's at least because now they're going to be able to reach their audience, which is hell of a lot of people. Um, their single malt does not taste like most of the other American single malts being made right now. That's okay. Mm. One of the things I love about single malt, and I think you guys do too, is that it is a very diverse whiskey in terms of flavor and yeah, can, variability. It's the beauty of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. The beauty yeah. Of it. Um, yeah, still a long way to go, but, but, but we're starting, we're, we're all already so far down the road. There's just a lot more road. Okay. Do you have a big player in North Carolina? For single malt? Yeah. Mm. Do, you, do, you have, do you have any any one? Anyone uh, that's kind of at the forefront of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, <I'm> just... <laughs> there's uh, North Carolina's craft distilling industry is still pretty small. The, the state hmm. has not perhaps made it super easy. For, for craft distillers. Um, no, I, and I actually haven't That's interesting visited very many distilleries. I'm going to one next week and it's my goal for 2023 to hit up a lot more. Um, yep. but <laughs> Smart. no, unfortunately my experience with, with the North Carolina whiskeys that I've had has been not good, <laughs> but, uh, but I've, really there's su- a lot I haven't tried. So I am, Looking forward to continuing to explore. <laughs> that, that really surprises me, given, I mean, my my understanding of of American whiskey and its history is is a bit sparse. It's a bit shoddy. But my understanding is that there was a period of time where North Carolina played a pretty decent part in the in the growth of the spirit. And so the fact that while there's this massive boom throughout you know most of the states it's surprising that north carolina seems comparatively small there's just such a um weird still weird subculture of like anti-alcohol um Uh, folks around here i mean it's we are a really strict control state and anytime Uh, Um, the legislature tries to introduce reforms, you know, the, the usual characters come out of the woodwork and talk about how corrupting alcohol is spirits in particular. North Carolina has a great, um, craft beer industry, very thriving. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a weird little place. I think slowly things are coming along. There are more distilleries that have opened in the last, say, four to five years than um, like 10 years ago. There were probably, I don't know, a half dozen distilleries tops. And now there's a lot more. Um, I think it, mm. the state's just behind other mm. parts of the country that, that got into the movement earlier and made it gotcha. made it easy for, for people to... Uh, to open distilleries and make them into viable businesses. Yeah. Can I pivot just 
a little bit with with 2023 in mind. I I had a question regarding a trend I started seeing in 2022. I'm curious if you saw the same and what you think it's going to look like in 2023. And that trend is more and more shops. Let me do this again. (laughs) 10 years ago, (laughs) 10 years ago, you would have the specialty shops that would have their own single barrel of McKenna, Blanton's, you know, insert distillery here. And that was a special thing. And you went to that store if you were a whiskey fanatic because they had this special stuff and, you know, Joe's mom and pop didn't. Fast forward 10 years <laughs> and everybody I has their own I know what Joe's mom barrel. and pop are selling. Yeah, right? <laughs> everybody has their own single barrel. In fact, they have multiple single barrels. But what we've, what I've been hearing from some retailers is that those single barrels are not moving like they had been. They're sitting on more inventory than they than they had been previously. And so I wonder if you saw the same sort of evolution of that and, and what your thoughts are on 2023 and beyond for mm-hmm. that idea of the store pick. I don't talk to retailers the way you do. So I don't have oh, that okay. perspective and it's really interesting to hear it. I, <laughs> I will say I definitely think the momentum of excitement for single barrels has diminished um, mm-hmm. among the the sort of hardcore. Um, and I do think the hardcore bourbon drinkers, I think the more casual ones, again, are probably still, oh, a single barrel. That's different from the last thing I bought here the other day. Okay, let me try it. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, they're just, there's been a glut. Everybody has a dozen different single barrels how as as the person who's going into the shop with a hundred dollars to spend how do you choose you know do you choose based on well i liked i liked uh the single barrel of this brand that they chose last time so i'll get this yeah. one again or oh no i'm afraid it might taste the same so let me try it something it's just it's impossible and um i, I i'm sure there's a name for this paradox but you know, at, at retail of any kind, um, if you have too much choice, uh, it can be um, oddly paralyzing to where you just when end up buying the same sad. thing again yeah. and again. And I think maybe yeah, we're Burian's seeing that ass. here. What is it? What's it called, Jason? Burian's ass is the paradox. His Burian's ass? ass? What about his ass? Burian's, Burian's ass, as in a donkey. <laughs> Mule. Like a double scribble, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Well, then, but then you look at okay, and and the and the the um, you look at Trader Joe's, right, which is wildly popular and has a highly selective, you know, um, stock inventory, and people go mm-hmm. crazy for just about everything that they put on their shelves, which I guess proves the Purian's ass. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So, by, no, no by, two asses are the same. <laughs> you can't compare these asses. Is that- um, <laughs> this is going to devolve really fast. <laughs> it only took us fifty-eight minutes, Susanna. We, we had to devolve somewhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting that you're hearing that from retailers that like the the single barrels are not moving the way they were, and I think it's just probably in large part. Um, due to the fact that there's a single barrel on every corner now. And not only yeah. does this store have 12 single barrels, but the store two blocks away does too. And the one four blocks from that. <laughs> and people just, it's, they're not special anymore. They're not, of course, every single yeah. barrel is a snowflake, yeah. but they're not actually that special. And if you have really hardcore, like people who collect single barrels from a given distillery or whatever, and they taste them, and the distillery has not been offering anything particularly special. Yeah. You know, that's very um, disillusioning. Hmm. I have, And again, a bad strategy. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Make sure the single barrels are special. Yeah, it's, it's a trend that I'm definitely watching closely in 23 to see where that goes. Um, Joshua Hatton? Well, I... <laughs> That's a trend that you're following, 
That's a trend that I'm following. I'm curious the trend that Suzanne is following. Are there trends for 2023 that have really captured your attention and you want to focus on? ASM is a big one, American Single Mall. I think Jack Daniels really threw the gauntlet down. I know that Jim Beam has American Single Malt ready to go. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. they released mm-hmm. some in last year's Little Book um, as part of the blend. Uh, oh, that's right. I, I yeah. bet, I, I I bet, Sazerac has some somewhere. I and maybe not much. I don't know. I don't know if Heaven Hill does, but you know, like I, MGP for sure has American Single Malt that I believe they sell already. Uh, potentially, Heaven Hill must have must have it because they did that eight year old malt, the Parker's Heritage malt, like. But six, it was a malt whiskey, ago. not a one hundred percent malt whiskey. No, but. Oh, I see what you're saying, that it was a mixed mash bill. It was yeah. a malt whiskey. It yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. a single malt mixed in with a gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Anyway, I, I, I think we might see more of the big guys roll out their American single malts this year. Um, now that Jack is is kind of starting to make make a little a little niche where once there was only a tiny niche. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> what else am I keeping an eye on? Uh, I'm interested to see when, when bourbon drinkers will stop buying these overpriced, no name brands that are, that are just regular mm-hmm. four year old bourbon. It just, there's so much of that. It's, and it all yeah. tastes and it can be very good. It can be just good, but it's not special. And you can buy yeah. bourbon, that's just as good from Beam Centauri, from Heaven Hill, you know, from mm-hmm. wherever yeah. for a lot less. And with, with the, the stamp of authenticity, because it's bottled under, you know, a real brand name. I don't know. I'm just like, I'm exhausted looking at the prices of things now for stuff that's like <laughs> fine, not, but not exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So what else? I mean, I'm with looking with with avid interest at e-commerce and direct to consumer shipping, which I think everybody in the industry is. Um, really, uh, find it very interesting that um, it's not only craft distillers pushing now for um, DTC, but you're seeing big guys get in, but in it, but in wow. ways that are that feel very. Um, you know, that they seem to be able to smooth it over with their distributors. So uh, Maker's Mark and I think Jim Beam both uh, launched these very small sort of um, direct shipping clubs for consumers in, mm-hmm. I think, 2021, late 2021. Um, yeah. Just releasing some some very small volume uh, things to the small list of people who are able to, to sign up. Um, and maybe that's the strategy other large companies are going to adopt. Although I think a lot are still super scared to piss off the R and D and Southerns of the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. yeah. And who knows how it's going to shake out. I do think eventually there's going to be much, much easier, freer DTC for consumers um, and that the wholesalers are kind of fighting a losing battle, and instead they should start working with the suppliers to, you know, still get whatever cut they can get um, instead mm-hmm. of instead of just ramming these statistics down our throat that they, you know, cooked up <laughs> from some <laughs> survey of America's mothers are terrified of direct shipping and believe it will kill all their children under the age of seventeen. Like it's just you know it's 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 so hyperbolic that I I find it yeah. really hard to believe that anyone falls for it. But of course, if you're not in the industry, this sounds totally credible. So, yeah, yeah, very interested to see if there's any progress on that front this year. I think it might be a stalemate, um, unless maybe there's a, maybe some individual states might might pass something. But I I think the pandemic. You know, say what you want about the pandemic, it wasn't all bad. It, I think, started to present some fresh data that if DTC direct to consumer was allowed, 
children wouldn't be found drunk in the streets. <laughs> and with DTC happening, well, they, they weren't drunk in the streets because they were drunk behind locked doors. But um, it's just no, I, I think it. Right, it got to show that it was a lot of scaremongering that had occurred, oh, 100%. and really, as we've right, yeah. it, the, it was about tax money. The right? thing or that cut, kills me, the thing that kills me, is that DTC wine shipping has been widely legal and widely practiced for decades, decades. And have we seen the end of the world with children, you know, getting their bottles of Cabernet Sauvignon and you know passing out drunk in the corner? <laughs> of course not. But but. This demonization of spirits um, yeah. is so infuriating, you know, and, and the wholesalers, I think, are really painting themselves into a corner in a number of ways, but including in that way by, by demonizing spirits and saying, well, they need to be treated differently from wine. Well, why? Mm. It's alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's all alcohol. Yeah. Okay. So a yeah. seven a seven fifty of vodka is going to get you drunk faster than a seven fifty of wine. That is true. Um, but if you simply explain to people that you don't drink vodka in a large wine glass, like you drink wine, you know, you drink you drink an ounce or an ounce and a half mixed with whatever, or done as a shot mm -hmm. if you must. Uh, you know, I I think I think it's so infantilizing to believe that consumers don't know the difference between a drink of a 40% ABV spirit and a 14% ABV wine. I just, I think that's mm -hmm. stupid. <laughs> of course we know. Mm -hmm. We can feel ourselves getting drunk if we have too much vodka or whiskey, you know, um, compare, you know, if you fill a wine glass with whiskey, yeah, you're, you're going to be in a rough place, but that's not how people drink it. <laughs> and they're not going to start drinking it if we allow them to to have it delivered by FedEx to their front door. Yeah. It's also so interesting. We spend all this time saying, will anybody think of the children? And now there are rumblings that Gen Z isn't a generation of drinkers, right? Yeah. Like, like is there... Do you think there's truth to that? I don't. I couldn't even tell you who Gen Z are. Um, <laughs> well, they're but, all but under again, 21, but, so it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are youngins. Um, you know, sure. Are they Are they going to have a have different drinking habits than the generations that come before them? Of course, millennials drink differently from Gen X, who drinks differently from Boomers. Um, mm. Are is Gen Z going to drink less? Maybe. Should the the industry panic about that? Absolutely not. I, you know, like it's just it's it, it, demographic changes. And what do you do? You you look at what those changes are and you figure out uh, how you can respond to that in a way that's responsible. Um, and and, you know, maybe it means making a little less money for 10 years um, or maybe <laughs> you're changing what you make and what you offer. Uh, remember, of like whiskey. Gen Z is also smoking a lot more marijuana than at least uh, legally, yeah, openly, right? Legally yeah. than previous generations. Yep. They have absolutely. other options. Um, I think it's great. I, I, I think, A, that, you know, different options are a positive thing because not everybody is the same, but we should hope that everybody can find enjoyment in the substance of their choice, the legal substance <laughs> of their choice. <laughs> Um, but B, you know, without, without the changes sparked by, um, changing tastes, changing demographics, you know, what is the industry going to do? They're just going to keep doing the same old thing. And eventually, I mean, sometimes that's good. You do. I, I don't want Glenn Farkless ever to change. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want Springbank ever to, to change, but other times it's like, well, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing Jack Daniels raise their proof back up to 43% you know, where it mm -hmm. used to be um, there. I don't think we should fear those changes. We just have to ask ourselves uh, what do we value now and what do we want to preserve and, and how do we go about that? Yep. Yeah. We also know that the booze industry is spending billions in marijuana. We, we know <laughs> <Yes>. that <laughs> mm -hmm. those wholesalers that you were mentioning earlier are spending billions yeah, on, getting on marijuana and cannabis. Absolutely. Right? Like they're, they're, they're seeing that changing market happening right before their eyes and making sure they get a piece of the pie. Yeah. There's, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Beauty. All right. Well, <laughs> on that on that bombshell. <laughs> yeah, it's it's you know, usually we end our our conversations with what are you looking forward to and and I mean, granted we've dipped in and out of that for the entire conversation. So, Susanna, thank you so much for for your time. Um if if you're okay with it, I would love to make this a tradition. Let's take a look every new year. Let's take a look at what the next year is going to present. It's a nice way to start the new year with Susanna Skyver Barton. I would love that. Let's pencil it in for 2024. I will be there. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Cheers, Susanna. Well, thank you guys so much for, for asking me to join you and letting me pontificate. Um, I, I always enjoy telling people what I think, even if I'm dead wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, next January we'll be looking back on what you suggested Please. for 23. So, hum- humble me, humble me. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, have a great year, Susanna. We'll see oh, you. Same to you guys. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Thanks again ever so much to Susanna Skyver Barton. Susanna, it's it really is an honor to not just have you on the podcast, but to to call you a friend. And we look forward to connecting with you again this time of year, come 2024, when we get to look at the 2024 year in preview. That's going to be exciting. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And and I think holding feet to the fire. Mm. Right. What did happen in Scotch? What did happen with bourbon? What did happen with store picks? What did happen with the world of American single malt? Mm-hmm. What have we seen with distilleries in various countries? Yeah, I, I think that's going to be really exciting to come back and say, <laughs> what did it all look like? Um, I would implore our listeners to check out Susanna's website. Yes. Where they can follow along with, with her writings as they are coming out. She is Susanna Skyver Barton dot com. You can find the spellings of all of those on the masthead and the start <laughs> of the interview. You will see how many ends are in Susanna. You will see Skyver has no uh, repeating letters in it. It's it's very exciting. Very, very <laughs> exciting. Um, she did also tell us once we were off the record that there there will be a, a whiskey course coming from Susanna Skyver Barton. Right. Yep. And when we receive more information about that, we will pass that along. It will also be found at SusannaSkyverBarton.com. Mm-hmm. And um, our listeners can, can follow Susanna there. I'll also say you can find her Instagram and Twitter at What Tastes Good. Yes. And if you're in those social media places, she is well worth a follow. God, you two like your Twitters. I just, it's not my bag, man. I haven't been on Twitter for, gosh, nine months now. Oh, look at you. Oh, yeah, I cancelled that a long time ago. Huh. Wow, I thought I thought that was your like one your one place where you found social media refuge. No, it was a it was the one place I would dip into social media. I, I liked following politics on, on Twitter. I, I thought it was a pretty instantaneous report of huh. what was happening in politics. Yeah. And then as I was there I would get some tangential whiskey stuff. But um, I decided to find much better places to uh, really to follow long form politics and not short form. Smart. However, I would yeah. often find pundits and analysts who you could then follow the link through to their stuff from Twitter. But yeah. I'm, I'm sure you, listeners will be able to do the very same thing with Susanna through what tastes good and uh, and track her down and, and follow along. She's, as you and I have said, she is excellent. Um Oh, actually, she says here, this is on the top of her website. I'm currently working on a 12-part video series on the history of whiskey for Wondrium, set for release in 2024. There you go. So there you go. She's, exciting. She's got it in the first paragraph. Super exciting stuff. <laughs> got a 
bit of news that we need to share with our listeners. So I'm going to bring in the paper boy so we can do this properly. Okay. 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 See you on the other side. Break on through to the other side. Break on through. Break, 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 break. You and I and Jess worked hard, very hard, to get our U.S. retail release number nine here to the States so that it would arrive in time to start hitting store shelves so that people can purchase them and and have them with their Christmas and Hanukkah celebrations and New Year's celebrations. But unfortunately, the world was against us. We couldn't get the proper shipping in place. We couldn't get the containers. We had (laughs) holiday delays. You name it. The world was against us. However, it is a new year, Jason. It is 2023. And in this new year, I'm happy to say our whiskey retail release number nine is finally here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ready to be on store shelves. And I, I feel as if maybe the last episode, not the year in review episode but the one prior to that we shared some of the details of that release with our 30 or 40 year old Mm -hmm. invergordon from a refill sherry butt in there there's a seven-year-old kalila that's two refill bourbon barrels married together there's an inch gower 10 year old that's one sherry hoggy one bourbon Mm -hmm. hoggy married Mm -hmm. together Uh, then we have a rum a guatemalan rum uh, from the darsa distillery and that's from a first fill bourbon barrel. And I think that one's 10 years. Maybe it's 11 years. I think it's a 10-year-old. And then finally, it's our Wolf Island Take Two bottling. Now, that's that's retail, that's retail a retail release. Now, Indeed it is. We, Indeed it is. We have something that we're going to be doing really soon. Uh, and that's going to be on singlecastnation.com. So this is for our American or U.S.-based members or are members who have a U.S. base address that they can have bottles shipped to. We're doing something that's called the Celebration of the Nation. That is it. And there are going to be some really interesting deals and opportunities for bottlings that are on our website. We've, we've never really done anything like this before, and it's kind of exciting to be putting this into place. And so keep your eyes peeled. Where should they be looking, Jason? Definitely the private members only Facebook group. Okay. Can I say something real quick about that group? And it's it's from something you told me last week. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's on Facebook. More and more people are moving away from Facebook. Hmm. And one of the things you said to me the other day was, we just had our first spam bot, spam attack, <laughs> spam <laughs> bullshit yeah. in the group. Bullshit, that's the and, proper term. Yep. Right? And member Dan Grison called attention to it. Mm-hmm. You went in, dismissed it immediately, yeah. banned the person attached 100%. to it. 100%. And, and you'd even said to me, that person answered the four distinct questions to get into that group. And still delivered spam. But the reason I bring this up is we're so focused on that being a haven. I say that because you're very close to New Haven, Joshua. There we go. There we go. A haven in Facebook that members who sign up for that and participate in that can know that it's not going to devolve. One of the One of the questions, one of the agreements in joining it is you will not be an asshole in that group. Mm -hmm. If you're deemed to be an asshole, you are jettisoned from that group. Instantly. One strike and you're out. Done. Done. So it's it's a good spot. It is a good spot to hang out, have whiskey related chat with with like minded people and and you do a good job curating that, uh, Joshua. So so definitely the, the private members only Facebook group will will deliver information. I'm sure, I'm sure our Instagram will, will deliver information along the way there. And of course, we will email. So make sure 
info at singlecastnation.com is in your address book to try and limit the number of emails that uh, that make it to your junk folder, your yeah. spam folder. We can't fight it on our end. We can do our best. We make sure we don't do spammy subjects. We make sure we don't do spammy preview text. We try to make sure that the content is worthy of making it through a filter, a spam filter. Sometimes we just get batched into the mm-hmm. spam folder. So, so keep a listen there. And we really do. We want to put some things back to the nation that will serve as celebration. We've talked for years about getting bottles onto the website so you can make regular purchases there. Now we can actually take advantage of that availability to have some fun, celebrate the nation. Super exciting stuff to be putting out for our nation members. Speaking of exciting things and, and speaking of social media, <laughs> you, you mentioned this before, right? More and more people are are getting away from Facebook. They're getting away and they're they're looking at different social media platforms. And, and one of the things that we had found from almost from the beginning of this podcast is people would say, when are you going to get your podcast up on YouTube? And, you know, which, which is yeah. surprising to me because I've seen both of our faces. And I, and I think we both have faces for audio. And yet, people who we are standing in front of are asking about video. They're asking for video. And you know what? There's a lot of great uh, YouTube whiskey content on there. And that's where people look yeah. for certain yeah, content. Yeah. And yeah. so for the past seven years, you've been asking and, and we, <laughs> we're finally going to deliver. We are taking our extra, extra it's all about whiskey podcast, and we're pulling it. A well, pulling it makes it sound negative. We're migrating that podcast from the audio space uh, to to YouTube. So we're going to have a tight thirty five air quotes around that. Um, <laughs> now people can see our air quotes around <laughs> tight thirty five <laughs> uh, to to YouTube, and that's that's really exciting. Do you want to delve a little deeper into that, Jason? Yeah, you you know this, you know, and, I, and I've made it clear in today's episode. I I don't like celebrations. I don't like fun. I don't like change. I am I so like excited. <laughs> I'm so excited for this move to YouTube. I I really am, mm. and it's for me. It's the community, right? And I think there's a certain romance and enjoyment to being disembodied voices Mm. who receive disembodied communications from the people who listen to our disembodied voices, Mm. right? We put an audio podcast out into the world, we get emails back. And then when we're out and about in the world, we get to meet some of these people and they get to see us face to face. And it's, it's really wonderful. And One Nation Under Whiskey will remain in that format. Having extra, extra go to YouTube and every couple of weeks for for that podcast, you'll get to see our faces. You'll get to see us rolling our eyes at one another. (laughs) You'll get to see the air quotes around type 35. To me, it's the beginning of an embodied communication, right? right? Where you get to see us as you're hearing us. And one of the things we're moving towards, and we have discussed in pre-production, off-air for a change, is (laughs) the move to YouTube giving us the opportunity to drop the occasional, maybe, maybe they'll become more frequent, who knows what that future will hold, but we'll have a chance to be live and in person in certain instances Mm -hmm. with our listeners who have supported us on Extra Extra into a fourth season and on One Nation Under Whiskey through six full and we will begin our seventh in Mm -hmm. a month. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wild numbers, wild numbers. But but on top of that, Mm -hmm. even using YouTube a little more than just the podcast experience as well. You know, for a number of years, we've been putting tasting videos up there for the nation. We have 
a single Cast Nation channel that we have been populating. Maybe the time has come to populate that a little more, Joshua. I think so. And maybe change our YouTube uh, name to J&J Spirit, seeing as it's now a single Cast Nation and one nation under whiskey and God knows what else. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm excited for this because I enjoy I enjoy YouTube and I enjoy YouTube content and Mm -hmm. I like Mm -hmm. being able to make a comment during a lot. Like I love the idea of doing live events and being able to communicate with the people who are doing them live. So yeah, it's going to be a fun space. And we'll, we'll say more about this when the time comes, but just, just to show kind of a, a slight change in format as well, we will have the presentation of a, of a pertinent whiskey news story in the first half. We'll have riffing in the second half, but we're also adding in a a new releases component that won't be all the new releases of the day, no. but we're looking for ways and reasons to talk more whiskey and, and returning to that whiskey advocate top 20 of 22 list mm. where we were looking at it like who's that and what's that and who put that out we want to be more informed and we want to help better inform the listeners of extra extra as well yeah so i'm excited and for our very dear jess when we hold up a whiskey we'll be able to share the color of it on Ah. youtube (laughs) (laughs) that's right yeah explaining the whiskey what is the color well, now you get to see it. Yeah, there you go. Uh, speak, speaking of our, our very dear Jess, and to bring our new segment full circle before we close it, you rightly pointed out, Joshua, that, that you and I worked diligently to get that ninth release into the United States before the close of OND mm-hmm. and, and one thing uh, led to another, led to another. We couldn't work hard on that without Jess, boots on the ground in Uh Scotland, working hard on that. And boy, did she do everything in her power to get it moving as well. So yeah, when, when, kudos, when, kudos to her uh, as well. When I said we, I mean, I really meant Jess. I mean, <laughs> right? And I know that. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> For listeners, yeah, we means Jess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, right. Where where would we be without our dear Jess? But I tell you, I tell you, and and again, just to complete complete that circle, which you know, listeners know, Jason doesn't like, is to say how different to be sitting at the beginning of twenty twenty three and saying we have a retail release in this country that is working its way to stores, as opposed to twenty two when we were looking at what are the next steps, what's glass looking like, what's labels looking like, what's global shipping looking like. I'm not saying those problems have gone away. We just dealt with them at the tail end of last year. Yeah. And here we are starting a year stronger than we did last year. That is worth celebrating. If only we had something to pour, Ooh. Joshua. Well, may- maybe a little blind barrel oh, celebration. Go on. go on. I think the final remaining, is that sample C? It is not. <laughs> Is it and I know exactly which letter it is because I just pulled it out of my box. Oh. So I know exactly. It's, I'll give you a clue. Yeah. It's the letter that starts Deanston. So it's sample D. And, and here's the interesting thing about sample D, Jason, which you may not remember. <laughs> I forgot. But I told Seabass about this a while back. Oh no! It, it came. This this sample was a bit leaky, so I have maybe oh, no. a tenth of what's in there. And so, how about Jason? I'll, I'll pour what I have, but why don't I do the reading and you do the guessing, seeing as you have the majority of the okay. liquid to work from? Uh, yeah, I got mine's full. Yep, I just cracked the seal on a full sample bottle. 
Yeah. Oh wow, I completely forgot yeah. you'd lost yeah. that card. What would you say? There's Shoot. maybe a tenth left? Oh yeah. Yeah, you're way down yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, so, bummer, so dude. All right. So Jason Jason has poured his sample and I, I've poured I what, have what remains. Okay. I've got ideas already. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like it, immediately my nose thought American. And as I put my nose back into it, I'm getting a lot of fruit. Okay. So, um, so this is sample number D. Why don't you go ahead and describe the color for people? <laughs> you and your numbers and Ds. It <laughs> always gets me. Number D. Did I say number D? That's... You did. You did. It's not the first time, not the last time. Oh, my gosh. It is, it is a delicious, bright, mm -hmm. warm, gold leaning into amber. Mm, okay. And I have got a beautiful yeah. bright January day in my garden office here. So what oh, okay. I th <laughs> I thought your your notes, your your nasal notes oh. was a beautiful <laughs> Bright January no, color. Okay. No, yeah. No, no, no. It's it's reflecting as I hold it up to the window. Um, I my previous office was a darker space, literally and figuratively, than the current space I have, and so I am thoroughly enjoying how bright things are. I'm also fixing my mic cable while I'm saying all this, which. In the new Extra Extra, people will see me fixing my mic cable. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. So, so, so give it a nose. Give us, give us some notes. And So here's my problem, Joshua. Go ahead. My, my, and I think this is a, it's worth talking about this because it, it reflects the challenge of blind tasting, is my nose immediately said American. And the first whiff of it I had instantly confirmed American grain whiskey. Hmm. And as I return to this, I'm trying to get my brain to turn off American light whiskey, American grain whiskey, and be open to other things in here. And my brain keeps slamming the door on that. It's like, nope, you're getting orange gumdrops. Yep, get a bit of the spice from the gumdrops in there. You know that fruit you're getting? It's oranges and it's big orange peel. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, brain, you need to stop doing this. Yeah, I, we've got to be more open in a blind tasting. Wow. Yeah, that that's interesting. That really does seem to be home base for you when you when you don't know and you, you find you find the the single signpost, like it's gotta be this. Yeah. Because, yeah, and it's it's confirmation bias. Right. It's an initial. It's an initial conclusion <laughs> that needs to be deconstructed and unpacked. I, I, I will say, though, the best I can get my brain to do is open the doors beyond light whiskey. I still think we're playing in the American sandbox. Do you want me to read... There's a part that I could read here, the oh, sea bass's our take part, that I feel as if I can mm -hmm. read that and omit a few items that might help mm -hmm. you. you. You want me to I do that? Got an, I just got a hard water component, that industrial window putty okay. kind of component. I gave it a little shake and I got some on my hands to, to rub on my hands. I also used the double shake to see that it... Signs are pointing to cask strength on it. So here, here's one thing that I could tell you. Um, there's a note on here that I smelled immediately, and and I, I and I know it. Anywhere I find it, I know what it is. Mm -hmm. It's one of those telltale notes that helps me, like. For you, if you smell orange gumdrops, you say, okay, it's got it's got to be light whiskey. It's going to be in that realm. And you're not always correct. When I smell... I'm often incorrect. You're often incorrect. When I get this note, 
and it takes me to where my brain lets it be taken to, I would argue I'm more correct when I find this note and I, and I find it in this, in this bottling. Hmm. And do they, do they announce it in there? They do. Yeah. I was, I was, I was on. Yep. Well, if you and I were tasting this blind and you had all the liquid, if you got the note, tell me the note. So, uh, so it's a note that I have difficult describing, but I always attribute it to a very, very specific thing. And if I tell you what that very, very specific thing is, that might that might either help this overall or it might ruin <laughs> it overall. Just go ahead. Because if you were nosing this, you would have said this word or you would have described this out loud. Okay. I just have the benefit of the preamble now. So g- g- give me the note as you experienced it. The, the, I will say the oils on the side of this glass are remarkable. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. So... Like you, the initial nose, I said, okay, this is this is not single malt scotch whiskey, right? This doesn't seem mm-hmm. like a type of, of like malted barley product. Mm-hmm. But I got malted rye on the nose, which is ah, okay. something uh-huh. that I typically, typically do not like. So the reason I wanted you to say that out loud is because I think my, in Scotland, hard water note that that leads mm. me to the industrial, the window putty, mm-hmm. is a potential note on some malted rice. Ah, okay. When I know I'm not in the Scotch sandbox. It, it, now, now, of course, if we're talking malted rye, we might, might not necessarily be in America here. There are malted ryes being made in other parts of the world. That there is? Right, I've, our backwoods is a, a perfect example of a uh, of a rye whiskey that uses malted rye in the mash bill. Uh, our Australian backwoods, our Yakandanda backwoods. Yeah, yeah. This isn't the Dutch outfit, is it? Well, let's hear some notes. <laughs> My brain's trying to get some square 90 degree angles again. What can we start to box in here? So give it a taste. Give it a taste. See if you can get us some notes from the taste. And let us know, too, if the tasting of this whiskey um, modifies the the nosing of this whiskey. It's thinner on entry than the oils in the glass would suggest. A- I thought it was going to be really unctuous mm-hmm. coming in the door. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a bit thinner than expected. The flavors, I'm still getting the fruit from the nose. <laughs> I don't know if I want to start talking about brown cereal to the back of the palate. Mm. But th- there's there's something darker, heavier... Wood, dust, char. Mm. There's something to the back of the palate. I'm also curious about the strength of it because the bubbles are telling one story and the palate is telling another. Oh, okay. So what are the what are like the? I would yeah. put the strength somewhere around 54, 56. And palate. What would you? What would the palate say? Higher or lower? I would. I would put it somewhere in the forties, coming across the palate. Okay. Do do you want me to give you the ABV? Yeah, it comes. Yeah, it comes to strength. Yeah. Because I because I think if you took your palate ABV, multiply or added it to the bubble ABV and divided it by two, <laughs> you may come to what the actual ABV is. So it's fifty two point five percent. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it just it just doesn't hit the palate like that at all. No, it doesn't. It comes it comes off softer for me, and I get the the fruitiness that you're talking about, but it's almost like a candied fruitiness mixed with like like a plasticine, like uh, something very artificial almost coming through across the palate. The industrial yeah. builds on the palate. Yeah, it really does. Almost like solvent. Mm. 
which I, I know somebody could take as a as a very serious negative. I'm not necessarily saying it as a positive, but it, it's not like I'm, you know, throwing it out of my glass. Well, I mean, I'm uh, not getting a lot on the palate. As you're tasting the small quantity you've got, are you getting much from it on the palate? I think my glass would have benefited from having a full sample bottle. I think the oxidation over a year's period uh, where there's a tenth of the bottle left in it, it's it's making for a very thin, worse than insipid experience for me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not there. I'll say that yeah. out loud. It's definitely not there. But there's there's less to the palate. Like it comes out strong with the nose, mm-hmm. real promising. Mm-hmm. Light to the front of the palate, mm-hmm. gets a little heavier towards the back of the palate, mm-hmm. short finish. Definitely short finish. I would say that the palate comes across as if it's 43% and potentially even chill filtered, right? There there seems to be a <laughs> a thinness to the texture despite the oils that you're talking about on the glass. And that's the thing. The glass is telling a completely different story. Yeah. The, the oil in the glass is not suggesting any of that for the palate. So let, let's hear their, their paragraph. What's their paragraph? Do you, do you want to hear their, still... their tasting notes first? Oh, I, I thought that's what their paragraph was going to no, be, so their you, kind of summation. You, you've you got um, their tasting notes and then their overall take. Yeah, let's 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 participate with them. Let's let's hear their tasting notes. Okay, and I'm I'm nosing and tasting along with them. So aroma, clove, herbal wintergreen, spicy vanilla, rye bread, black pepper, honeyed apple. What was that last part about apple? Honeyed apple, which I, I think, honey. Yeah, I I honestly, see that. I thought you'd said uneaten apple. <laughs> honeyed apple. Do you know that okay. note of uneaten apple? <laughs> <laughs> like it's when it sits on your counter and just like starts to wrinkle over the course of weeks. You're like, it's death. gone too far, but I can't compost it yet. <laughs> like it's gonna grow mold before I can compost it. Taste. All right, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, I. I think we've been simpatico along a lot of these tasting notes. I'm not. I wish I was getting the exuberance that they were getting on the nose. Well, I tell you the the rye bread note. I I wouldn't call it for my, for me. I wouldn't call it like an Arnold's rye bread, but rather that that super thin, moist, sprouted rye German bread. I would get on the nose. That's a that's a very yeah. different proposition. I'm glad I went with the spiced gumdrop earlier because it allows me to lean on some of the spice that's happening mm. in here mm-hmm. uh, on the nose. So okay. I, I feel I feel at one with that. All right, All right onto the onto this palette, the palette. fifty-two point five. It's four things. Are you ready? Spicy yeah. grain, a hint of dill, caraway seed. And spearmint. <laughs> yeah, you and I have talked for years that I've always wanted to be able to get mint on noses and palates, and I don't often get it. I sometimes get a little bit of eucalyptus, and that makes me happy. The spearmint on the palate, the power of suggestion is strong with that one. I've, mm. I've got a freshness happening now since they've said it. You want the finish? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> quick, because it's not going to be around for long. Floral rose, nutmeg, unriped mango, and a touch mm-hmm. of oak. Mm-hmm. So do, do, you have, do you have any guesses at this point? 52.5. I, I'm just, I'm having this moment of cognitive dissonance between the bubbles, the oil in the glass... The much softer entry and the quick finish. It's it's not adding up for me. It's not telling a single consistent story. All right, let me. I, I to be honest with you, I wouldn't want to guess names on this. You wouldn't. You, you, listen, there's no way you could guess this. 
there's no way oh, I fantastic. would ever guess Because that takes me right off the yeah. hook. Right off the hook. So the distillery, it's unknown. <laughs> Uh, the bottler is Proof and Wood Ventures. So this is our, our friend Dave Schmier. Mm-hmm. The distillery is unknown, uh, presumed to be Kozuba and Sons Distillery. And the name of the bottling is simply called The Stranger. <laughs> I should have been I should have been holding it in my left hand. I made a mistake. <laughs> and it's the Stranger Polish whiskey. So this is 100% Polish malted rye, seven years of age, 52.5% alcohol. And on the label, it says this rye was distilled from 100% rye in Poland Poland, and aged in the USA in ex-bourbon in ex-rye barrels. And it's a, a batch of 10 barrels. And so this is the blind barrel's our take on the whiskey. So would before I read that, would you have guessed a Polish malted rye? No, I, I would have no. I would have no way to guess Polish. I, the name of this game is not to like or dislike the whiskey, but to play the blind, the blind game mm. of what are the clues? Where are the clues leading us? I'm going to go down the path of of saying out loud that I didn't necessarily like this whiskey. Yeah, yeah, I didn't enjoy it. But I'm really happy that I can add some knowledge of Polish malted rye to my lexicon. Mm-hmm. Like that to me is the purpose of either playing this game or you know, talking with sea bass and, and blind barrels, they have curated a selection in this pack that I would not have known about <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. And yeah. even if I didn't like, even if I wouldn't go out and buy a bottle of this, they're on my radar now. Mm-hmm. I'm going to recognize the name going forward. I'm going to think about Polish rye going forward. I'm going to think about our Polish friend John Kay and say, hey, John, have you tried, you know, this distill, this undisclosed Polish distillery? Um, have you have you tried that? Do you know anything about that? It's a conversation starter. Yeah. And I, I think that is worth plenty, absolute plenty. So, uh, you know, we're not here to like or dislike a whiskey, but we are here to learn. And I have learned this day. I enjoyed tasting it by itself simply for a reference because i have had polish rye before but it's been in the form of it being blended into a larger barrel bourbon bottling Mm. and Mm, yeah yeah yeah. right and being able to taste this by itself will help me to sort of uh contextualize that portion of the blend like what what are the flavors of the polish malted rye doing to this larger barrel bourbon bottling right and it's nice to kind of know the origins of that and see what that whiskey can do in conjunction to other ones so so i liked it from that perspective yeah 100 yeah. percent. So, i actually i actually just spilled some on my desk making a second pour of it there you go <laughs> so so this is their take says, let's see how you can handle the curve. And then in parentheses, <laughs> in parentheses, it says sports ball reference, Joshua. It says, I admit to being slightly biased by my Polish heritage. And this comes from uh, Seabass, Christopher Sebastian. But this experiment greatly intrigued me with regards to terroir, old world grains, and the freedom to use a variety of casks in aging. Add to that the story of the presumed distillery moving their operation from Poland to America to pursue a market that it is that is thirsty for craft spirits, and you've got a fun combination. Don't be, quote, the stranger to bold strokes. There you go. Yeah. yeah. 
I I like that. I I didn't know He's that. Right. Yeah. I didn't know that part of the story where where this distillery sort of took took their operation. They're, they're moving it to the U.S. to do yeah. rye in the U.S. I think that's kind of cool. It's interesting that it's released as a as an undisclosed with a presumed to be attached to it. Yeah, that that I don't know. Um, yeah. But, but That's it, the hoop jumping that we often get to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> I like this release enough to put it out. I have to do what with this story? Okay, I do like this though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definite learning experience today. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by that solventy nature of it. I've kind of retraced my steps here. Well, I'll tell you the, the solventy aspect to it, while while these notes don't apply, it, it makes me think of some of the older uh, Jefferson's bottlings, like from 10 years ago, the old 18 year when, when I think that was Stitzel Weller liquid. And, and there was this model glue note that if you mm-hmm. focus on it just being mm-hmm. model glue, you're like, is that okay? But with everything else, it was this bright, sweet character that, that really helped the whole experience. So the, like a solventy quality can be a nice quality if it's a part and parcel to the many other things going on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just staring at it in my glass like, <laughs> holy shit, I've just taken a journey with this blind uh-huh. sample D. Sincere thanks to Seabass, Christopher Sebastian, for, for putting together a pack just for us on One Nation mm-hmm. Under Whiskey. With notes, with, you know, backstory. He put in a lot of work and we are continuing our collaboration with Blind Barrels in 2023. I'm excited to see what the next pack is. Mm, okay. um, for anybody who's kind of joining us and, and wondering what the hell we're talking about, uh, Blind Barrels can be found at blindbarrels.com. They will curate a selection of blind samples for you, send them to your doorstep with information. And you can do what we've done today is take a journey, learn something new, revisit perhaps an old favorite in a new guise. And to be clear, Blind Barrels do not send us packs that are in circulation no. so as to avoid us revealing spoilers. Which we're, we're, we're good stand-up chaps. We're not in the business of revealing spoilers. No. But if you listen to this before getting your pack, we may inadvertently do so. So we have our own curated pack for One Nation Under Whiskey, which I love. I love and I appreciate. That's pretty special. It's a very, very nice gesture yeah. from, from old sea bass over in California. <laughs> time for any mail but with that said rather than read a piece of mail that may have come in i'd like to urge our listeners to send in some new mail because we are preparing for our annual mailbag episode which is the final episode of each season now in seasons past People would send us questions either about the industry, about bottlings, about ourselves, about anything. They had questions, we would answer them. And this time around, we're going to be recording that mailbag episode along with uh, our dear Jess and Elijah while we're all together in Seattle in February. And so we'll look forward to that. Yeah, right. So if you've got questions for us, Send them in. If you've got questions for Elijah or Jess, send them in. If you have questions that you want Elijah or Jess to ask us, send them in. Uh, whatever it yeah. is, I, I think I think bringing these two in kind of adds a wrinkle to the you know established fun time that we have. That might just make the whole experience that much more fun. Yeah, we're all about fun, collaboration, chitty chatties. We'll all be in Seattle together. I think this will be the first time the four of us are together as a singular workforce. As a singular company. Amazing. 
fucking amazing. That is remarkable <laughs> to, to consider. It's wild. So if you have a question for us, send it in to questions at one nation under whiskey.com. No E in whiskey or info at singlecastnation.com. You can send it in that way. Um, and we will bring them all together. We'll read them on air. We'll answer them on air. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I know we talk about the year in review being a fun episode to record, <laughs> but I, I I like the mailbag episode because it, it's really – because we're not doing live YouTube events all the time. This is the, the closest to some interaction we get to our listeners, so I look forward to that. Yeah. We could pick every episode as our favorite. We could pick every SCN release of the year as our favorite, right? Yeah. These are – wonderful wonderful aspects of what we do and communicating with our listeners is another wonderful wonderful aspect of what it is what we do that that we we do do. (laughs) and we will see everybody on the youtubes for the next extra extra episode and what's the date on that jason wednesday january 18. Beauty. And on that note, Jason, I raise, I doth raise my glass <laughs> to you and to our listeners and to Christopher Sebastian and the folks at Blind Barrel and to Susanna Skyver Barton. Indeed. Cheers and a happy 2023 for all. Cheers. Year in preview. So this, Are we putting music anywhere in around here? Yeah. Yeah, maybe a little cool in the gang, a little celebrate good time. <laughs> Come on. Boom, boom, boom. I was just thinking, don't, don't you have interstitials? What's that? You have interstitials to get us out of news and into the next segment? I had a case of interstitials, but there's a, there was a cream for it. I had, I had a flock of seagulls. You ever seen that? Again, back to the scatological humor. When you, when you go to the toilet and you have a flock of seagulls, it's when you only shit yeah. on the bowl and there's nothing in the water. Uh-huh.